I would like to welcome the moderator who will guide us through this session. He is here for the third time. He is editor-in-chief at Dagblad Børsen. It is Nils Lunde. Thank you. I'm honored to be here today. This is my third time as moderator at this really fantastic event. I'm very happy uh, to be here today. I'm going to moderate a debate with Mads Nipper of uh, Grundfos. I'm sure many of you know Grundfos and also Mads. Uh, Mads is CEO at Grundfos. He has been there for a little more than a year and he is presently doing a turnaround of the company. Early on, Mass was for more than 20 years at Lego, and Mass has played a crucial role in this phenomenal turnaround of Lego, which all are aware of. So please, everybody, a warm welcome to Mass. Thank you very much, Nils, uh, and for the kind words, and, and not least for the kind invitation. I have to say that it's, it's not a secret that a few invites for speeches get uh, into my inbox or my into, into my secretary. And when this wonderful invitation came and said, there's this kind of a student arrangement in Aarhus, would you prioritize that? I said, ah, I'm not entirely sure. I said, maybe you should take a closer look at what it is. And I did. Uh, and I have to say, I'm, ex I'm extremely impressed both from reading from it and now I have to say being here is, is, is qu quite amazing. I had no idea such a wonderful event took place, even though, of course, I should have known as a representative of the local business. Now, I will uh, I'll jump straight into it. Uh, and, and before I go to the agenda, I'll just tell a couple of words about myself. This is my pr entire adult life, as Nils said. Uh, I, have, uh, I have spent most of the time with Lego. I was slowly getting used to the thought and happily getting used to the thought that I was going to retire there because what greater privilege than to bring the world's best play experience into millions and millions of children's hands. I could think of no greater privilege uh, until Jens Moberg called, as he says in the program, and I said, I'm sure you have the wrong number because I'm not an engineer. And by the way, I've been in the toy business for 23 years, so I'm probably not your man. When, but when Jens talk started to talk about Grundfos, I have to say, at every occasion, and it was not because, and if you only remember one thing, and if, if I can create one belief in your minds, is that I did not primarily take the job because it was a CEO job. If I leave you with that thought, I'll be happy. If I leave you with a few more, I'll be even happier. Now, but you might think, what person who is reasonably sane still, would replace a world of ultimately happy children. Lego is the only brand in the world that can make an immigration, American immigration officer smile when you tell him what you do, and replace for a dirty world of plumbers, wastewater, and sewers, where you move water, essentially. And I have to say, I'll, I'll give you the answer a little bit later. And I will give it as, a, as sort of the end of the first section, which is talking about Gornfoss, because Gornfoss is is a fantastic company. Not only is it one of the really large Danish industrial companies, it's actually a company who plays a much more important role in the world than I would bet 99% of people in the world would actually know. I'm going to tell you about that. Then I'll tell you about the situation that Gonfos found itself and still finds itself in, what the strategy or the direction is, and then I will talk, Lars Reibien said a few, a few minutes ago, he's, he had to include something about innovation and technology. Now I will tell you about how somebody who is actually educated in this place can thrive and even lead a bunch of engineers uh, in Bjergbro. I'll tell you a little bit about that and how I believe I add at least a little bit of leadership value to that. And finally, what are all or some of the most important unanswered questions? Because one of the most important things to be aware of as a top leader is to know what you don't know about because that will help you search in the right places. Now, starting with Grundfos, I, I think that if you look at Danish business, big businesses, successful businesses that make a dent in the world, I think you will all find that they were started by pioneers who had a purpose in life. Our pioneer was Paul Dewey Jensen, the older, there's a younger Paul Dewey Jensen as well. Now, Paul Dewey Jensen, he started, he was grown up as an, as an orphan, and he made his first pump by coincidence. Exactly like in Lego, where the first Lego brick was made by coincidence after a wooden toy factory burnt down. That's how life is. In many cases, you don't think your way to the great ideas. 
they just happen and you pursue them with great vigilance. Exactly the same happened here. This was the first pump ever made uh, in Gornfoss. It was called the pig and it was because a farmer said to him, I need water, can you help? And he was an and, and not an engineer, he was an inventor by heart and he made it. And the, ne the past 70 years has now turned Gornfoss into the biggest pump manufacturer in the world. 70 years old, uh, 80 companies around the world, so next to Novo and Maersk and Danfoss, one of, I believe, the most globally present companies that this fine uh, country has. We make approximately 16 million uh, pumps a year. We are 19,000 people. I actually just calculated on the back of an envelope that we have approximately the same sales per employee as Novo Nordis has profit per employee, so it's not exactly impressive. But Novo Nordis is also in a league of its own, I have to say. But we are, not, we are actually not doing that poorly, but, uh, but I'll come back to that. We, had, we do approximately 24 billion Danish kroner, 3.2 billion euro, and we have one owner, which is not entirely true, because we are foundation-owned and not family-owned, as many people think, because Paul Dewey Jensen, when he died, he said he did not want any possible family disagreements to destroy Grundfos, so 87% of Grundfos is owned by an independent foundation. Now you know that as well. Now, if you want to know why is Grundfos Grundfos, Lars Reben said a minute ago, he said, what is the reason why, why Novo is doing better than the competitors? He only had one answer, focus. And I would say, why is, is Grundfos what it is today? I only have one answer, red circulator pumps. <laughs> that is the inner core of what Grundfos is about. And as Nils wrote in his wonderful book about my previous employer, where he said the inner core of what Lego is about is Lego City. Fire trucks, police stations, and so on. That is what Lego is about, and then you can build stuff on top of that. But if you don't understand your money-making logic, your inner core business, trying to expand on top of that is lethal. The inner core business of Grundfos is this. If you take a slightly deeper look at that, here's an elaborated version. Because not only do we make red circulator pumps who circulate the hot water in many one-family households in Europe and across the world, but also if you see here, starting in this case, strangely, actually the energy consumption increased in the happy 70s before the energy crisis came. Uh, but then, since then, it's gone down to now a, a circulator pump in my basement would typically run at 8 watts. That's less than, than a light bulb. And therefore, that is actually one of the, it's the inner core story of why Gornfoss it is what it is today, but it is at the same time one of the key stories why we have the challenges we have, because who cares about whether your circulator pump spends 8 watts or 6 watts? That is not of critical importance anymore. Now, but these are two other t product uh, types uh, which, which are critically important. Submersible pumps that pump groundwater up for irrigation or for, for water supply, and a pressure booster pump for industries and for high-rise buildings, for cooling systems. Those are the products that make Gornfoss today. We have 1.2 million different product numbers. So if you get to the core of it, these three is what it's all about. Now, to the more purpose-driven part, one of the things that Jens said when he called me that I had zero idea about was he said, do you have any idea how large a share of total world electricity is spent on electrical pumps? 10%. 10% of total world electricity is spent on electrical pumps. I would have guessed 1, maybe 2%. And if you think about why Gornfoss is around, we are the technology leader in, uh, in pumps worldwide. And if all of these pumps were magically replaced by existing technology today, magically overnight, all pumps were replaced by existing technology that we primarily have developed, that could be reduced to 4%. And as an industry leader, not only in size, but also in innovation, all your competitors will copy you. And that means if we continue to set the greatest standards and our competitors feel compelled to copy the latest technology, then Grundfos alone has a very realistic potential to lower total world electricity consumption by percentages. And I cannot think of many other companies that can actually have such a, have have such a potential. In China, the, se the corresponding number is 20%. It's a mind-blowing number if you look at the total electricity consumption. At the same time, World Economic Forum uh, that meets in Davos every year, they have just named water scarcity as the single biggest risk in the world. Bigger risk than an unsustainable energy consumption. Bigger risk than political risk. Bigger risk than armed conflict. Water scarcity. 
that's what uh, the, the future wars are going to be fought about. And if you think about what Grundfos is ultimately about, it is actually primarily about water. And if you, I've, I give you just a few cases. One, I'd actually, in the interest of time, I'll only give you one. If you think about many places in the world, northern or California, northern China, super water scarce already. Only going to get worse. And the problem is only 2% of world water is so clean you can drink it or meaningfully use it. So there's no scarcity of water. There's just too much water, too dirty water in the wrong places. And that is why, why moving water and cleaning water and limiting water wastage is incredibly important. Give you one example. The cleanest water you find in water supply in cities. Now, even a very modern city like Copenhagen, that's actually the world standard. 15% of all water that goes into the piping system supplying the, the city gets lost because of leaks in the pipe system. London, the corresponding number is 40%. Budapest and Hungary, 70, 70%. Imagine a producer of beer or milk or Lego bricks that lose between 15 and 70% of your production on the way to the customer. It's an inconceivable thought. And Grundfos actually has existing technology that can half the waste of that water. So also on the water agenda, there is a re very, very realistic potential to save millions and millions of cubic meters of the cleanest water we have. That's why I took the job. Now, and that is what the purpose of this company is all about. We do contribute to sustainability and we do pioneer technologies. I do not personally. I have very little clue about the technologies, but I have a passion for them. And we do want to ultimately increase quality of life for people because we take many things for granted in our daily lives. Turn up the water. There's water. It's clean and it's hot if you want it. That's not a privilege that by far the majority of the people have. There we can also help, but surely also the care for the planet where we have ways and existing technologies that can make us save water to the great benefit of humanity and we can lower, realistically, lower energy and electricity consumption by percentages. That's what Grundfos is ultimately about, not about a pump manufacturer 40 kilometers west from here. Now, situation. I took the liberty when I started to ask people, because I am not a very smart person, so I asked people what is our situation. I got a lot of answers. Very passionate people here from Grundfos Olympics. Number one position, so scale advantages. Manufacturing 14, 14 countries in the world. True global pr uh, presence. Technology leadership in all, pretty much all the segments we were in. Very high motivation and engagement of our people and customer loyalty exceptionally high. World leading, higher than Lego's retailer loyalty by the way, and that's like, super high. So super high customer loyalty very strong European core market and many core processes in manufacturing everywhere else that actually work well. Check many, many assets to build on and many strong capabilities. But I also asked, what can we do better? One thing was, and one of the things that I love about Grundfos, it is so fantastically ambitious. So if you ask the question, so what product group out of the 52 product group or 1.2 million product number, what's most important and what country is most important? It is all important. And everybody, I mean, that's the first day you step into business school. You see, if you make too many priorities, you don't make any priorities. So there are not many priorities, and everybody was screaming clear priorities. Competitors, especially out of China, being able to supply 80% of the efficiency at 50% of the price, talk to any industry company in the world, that's a challenge. It's also a challenge for Grundfos. Many functions doing exceptionally well but not particularly good at collaborating across the organization. Many places, excessive bureauc bureaucracy that has mushroomed on top of each other. So, in, so if, if something becomes complex, employ some people to coordinate things, and that has sometimes meant that our processes are excessively co uh, co uh, complex. And one example, there was a wonderful specific example I wrote about on my blog, was that there was an, an investment request of 20,000 euros, so 150,000 Danish kroner for a machine that stood still. So just something to repair the machine. That had to have 10 signatures and it took almost a month to find the 10 people to sign it. And while that happened, the machine stood still. So 10 signatures to approve 150,000 Danish kroner in a company that does 24 billion of turnover. 
That is bureaucracy, ladies and gentlemen. So that needs to be cleaned up. Forgetting, not forgetting, but not truly understanding the customer is something that was asked for. An existing strategy which was exactly 272 pa 72 pages, which had the wonderful result that nobody ever read it. But the other result is, when you make something so detailed, I guarantee you that before the ink is dry, the world has, through Russia crisis, new legislation, new competitors, the world has changed so much that it is obsolete before it's dry. So that was uh, essentially a, a ritual burning of that. And then honestly also, that was told, even by my colleagues in the top management team, top management had not been a wonderful role model for ensuring that there was strong collaboration across. So that was the situation we found ourselves in. And interestingly, the financial result was like this. So this is in Euro, th so 320 uh, million uh, in, in, in profit before tax, now declining linearly with approximately two percentage points loss in return on sales every year. You don't have to be a PhD in mathematics to project that curve for another two years, then we'd be loss making. And interestingly, many people in the Danish press wrote about a growth crisis in Grundfos. It's not a growth crisis. The world pump market had grown by 2%, not Lars Rebens 20%, but approximately 2%. Gronfos had grown similarly by around 4.5% in those years. So we gained global market share. But we were hopelessly unable to translate that into financial value. And you may reasonably say, so what's the big deal? You're foundation owned, you don't have to make quarterly reports, you're in it for the greater good. Yes. But a critical part is we want to stay independent. We want to always have the financial muscle to stay ahead in innovation, potentially make acquisitions. And if this continues, last year we did a negative cash flow, then we won't have that ability. And then ultimately we cannot or no longer afford what is right to do for the long term. So we found ourselves in this situation. I don't know if you've ever seen what happens to a frog. If you put a live frog into a pot of boiling water, it will immediately jump out. That is what happened in Lego in 2003 and 4. Life-threatening crisis that held, hit like a hammer. Everybody knew it's terrible. We have to do something immediately now. In Grundfos, this was the picture. Lost a little bit every year, but for most people, 927 million Danish kroner is still an amazing amount of money. It's, it's huge. And we lose a little bit every year. That is much, much, much more dangerous for any management team than it is to be in a life-threatening crisis overnight. So realizing the situation and where we're heading was an absolutely critical part. So we made a strategy, and the interesting thing was, this was not a mistake, I put this up again, but the foundation of what the company is all about, we did not change a comma. We simplified. We took a lot of things away. There was an innovation intent, there were leadership principles, there were all kinds of things which meant that executives around the world could always find diplomatic immunity to take an action and saying, yes, yes, but it, s it says in our strategy. So we simplified and said in our strategic foundation is only our purpose and our six values and some policies. Everything else was taken away, so simplifying it. But the uh, essence of what the company tries to be is completely unchanged. Then we also said, we are in the premium market. When I was in these fine buildings almost 30 years ago, Michael Porter was a big deal with competitive advantage, saying you are either cost leader or differentiated. It's still true. We were trying to be, especially in Asia, something we were not. And the interesting thing was, the reason why we cannot compete or could not compete in a super competitive Asian market was not because our production costs were too high. We can produce as cheap as anybody. But if we want to have the global presence and spend 6% in R&D and so on, there's no way we can compete effectively with Nanfang, who has a fraction of our fixed cost base. No way. No matter how cheap we can produce moon manufacturing to, to Vietnam, if we try to be an innovation leader at the same time be the lowest in cost, we will eventually die. So we're saying we are in the premium market, but take damn good care it doesn't become a niche market. Premium is a critical word in our strategy. Then we made priorities. What segments are we in? That was simplified. We, what products are we in? We said out of our 52 product groups, eight are absolute first priority, and we want to use 95% of our innovation and go-to-market resources on those, and the others are opportunistic. Because without that priority, these eight product groups, where I won't bore you with what they're called, they are 60% of our sales, 
95% of our profit. And we, if we don't give all the resources we have first to them, then we'll be defocused, and then we'll never be able to fund some of the expansions we do in the other areas. So making very clear priorities. And then every single country in which we are present was segmented in one or four buckets to say either we invest for growth, either we will, will eventually invest for growth, but we can't afford it now. We are a strategic core market like Denmark or Germany. It will not be a huge growth market, but it's super important. And if we start losing share, that's where we fight the hardest or your profit market, where it's essentially not important whether you grow or not, but please improve your profit. That gives a much clearer direction than if everybody thinks it's just about growth. The more I can grow, the better it is, because that destroys value in many cases. So we changed that as well. And now this is the essence of the strategy. Uh, we set five KPIs that focus on all stakeholders, not just financial value creation. So customer, employee, financials, and growth, where growth is the one that drives how much good we do in the world. And then five must win battles that are the essential building blocks in how we're going to be successful, not just in the next five years, but beyond that. Must win battle one is about efficiency. Must win battle five is about changing our culture. And must win battle two to three, so in the middle of the sandwich, that is what we do to create a, a path and a foundation for future growth beyond what we do today. So that's, I won't bore you with it, that's a, an hour long speech about the, the, the strategy, but this is the essence of our strategy. And I promised it to be 10 pages. It ended up being 15, but there were PowerPoint slides without many words on it. So reduction from 272 to 15 is also not that bad. And then of course, we started specific actions because there's nothing worse than a strategy where an organization says it's just words. So we have started some very important actions that we are starting to see at least some action on. But you will know if you start an, at an organization who is really passionate about their purpose and what you mainly talk about is savings and efficiencies and process optimization, that is a tough sell. But on the other hand, it is something that's absolutely necessary to do. And I think many cases in Danish business, including what Nils Bjorn and Danfoss have done, just proves it is necessary to first create a platform for your business and then scale it afterwards. Now, then I'll talk about uh, what it's like to lead a technology uh, company. And I have only, as Neil said, only just over one year's experience. So please don't take my word for it. But I have a hypothesis what it's like. Now, this is a me metaphor I used many times in my Lego time. Because at Lego, we were asked many times, so when is it a question, this is like going to be like Blockbuster or fax machines or, 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 or Kodak? where your te existing technology, so plastic bricks, are going to be replaced by digital play. You can actually make a strong case that that is not a stupid challenge. I was even called by a consultant who makes 200,000 Danish kroner a day and said, you should say, what is the day when you produce your last Lego brick? And of course, that is absolute nonsense. Nonsense. And talking about the inner core, so the play themes of Lego, while that was sort of the inner part of that, but the challenge is, whether it's Lego bricks or circulator pumps or water supply pumps, all of those can either today or tomorrow be copied by somebody who makes exactly the same clutch power or very close to the same energy efficiency. So your core product is at risk of being obsolete, not obsolete, but outcompeted by people who can do it more effectively than you. So you have to, in my opinion, you have to build additional layers of competitive advantages around it. And if you ask the Chinese play producers today, why the hell can we not outcompete Lego? Because we can make bricks exactly the same quality. Well, that's because model design, digitalization, storytelling, TV series, video games, even movies have made them move Lego move way beyond quality of plastic bricks. But if they ever did it, and if they ever do it in the future where they say the core product really doesn't matter anymore, it's only about storytelling and digitalization, it will wither and die. Exactly the same for Grundfos. Our core product has to be industry leading. But the days where Grundfos will have a great idea and an energy efficient pump for 10 years in peace, and then we will, there will be somebody eventually in 5 or 10 years copying us, won't happen anymore. Because what happens previously hap took five years, maybe now take six or 12 months, and we are copied. And we cannot innovate so fast 
that we can always stay way ahead on the product. So we need to build additional layers of competitive advantage on top of the technology. That's why technology cannot stand alone. So that's one thing. The other thing is, now, we are very good at selling components, either pumps or control boxes, something like this. We're good at that. But most customers, they actually do not want components unless they're an OEM customer. They actually want a solution and say, I want this job done, which this can do. So we need to systematically build, not say that we want solutions, because that's been done for 15 years in Grundfos, but to systematically build a capability in making solutions. And we've actually, strangely enough, that we've asked, have been asked many strange questions and good challenging questions from our colleagues, saying, so who leads that? Is that your best engineer? No, it's my head of HR. Not because he knows anything about solution sales. But solution sales is not something that any person can do. It is a systematic capability building, and the difference between competence and capability is competence is in the minds of people, but capabilities is processes, systems, mechanisms, and so on. And building a solution, including what's the financial return on the gross margins on those, substantially different than if you sell a component. So this is a major, major change that we will have to do unless we just want to be a sub-supplier to a sub-supplier in the future. And now, this I won't bore you with, I promise. But for each of the eight critical product groups, it is no longer about what the engineers can think of. Because that has historically made great strides and, and benefits for Grundfos. But if we lead technology by saying, so where can you come up with good ideas? What if they come up with good ideas in our priority number 39? Should we then put all our resources behind it? Of course not. We should say our eight critical product groups, most important. We will make roadmaps and saying for circulators, as an example, what is our vision? Where are we headed towards? What product launches do we want? What capabilities do we need to build? Because then we will know and be able to plan where do we put our resources. If we do it the other way around, and saying where can we get the good ideas, ultimately there's a huge risk we'll be defocused, and then we will not have any priorities again. So that's another thing. And then this is probably my favorite example, where I talked about this, where I was saying maybe even if we can get this a little bit further down, honestly, who cares? I'm not sure that many house owners would say, call your VVS installer and saying, could you replace my pump? It works perfectly fine, but I can save two watts a year. I'm not sure you will do that. And it's not even a super big benefit to the world. But instead here we took, instead of spending 200 million Danish kroner developing a totally new technological generation here, we said, you, the only visual difference here is there's a red visual demarcation here around it. And then we developed a little thing which cost 5 million, not 200, which is called the Alpha Reader. Which means it is, I'm being a little bit technical, and I'm proud of it because I'm a commercial guy. Now, this, if you, uh, in Germany as an example, it's a, it's a law requirement. You have to balance your heating system because that optimizes your energy consumption. And until today, you have to have two installers out because one has to knock the radiator and one has to stand in the pump and they say, yep, you're ready. But with an alpha reader, simple technology, you put this on and you can drive only one out, you can go one guy only. And we say, yes, but why do you want a, bla a blacksmith like him? Who cares about him? Well, because he's our customer. He's not the one who pays our products. But if the only reason why people call an installer is when the heating system don't work. And in many cases, it's because the pump is broken. And then he will tell them and saying, your pump is broken. And then they'll tell him, go buy a new pump. They will not say, go buy a Velo pump, or an Anfang pump, or a Grundfos pump. They will just say, fix it, please. So he's a decision maker. And if we make his life a little bit easier, we are being customer-centric, not technology-led. And this costs less than 5% of what a totally new generation of this would cost, with a much simpler technology, but by understanding deeper and richer our customer. And now this is, I have to tell it, it's a little bit out of context, but I talked a little bit about it at the lunch. This is the best most revolutionary product, not just from Grundfos, but in our industry. It's potentially the product that can change the world. It's a product I talked about that can save half the water leakage in the entire, uh, in the entire uh, municipal, municipal water supply. Guess how many systems we sold? 16 worldwide. And it's not expensive. But this is a wonderful example this potentially being the most revolutionary 
uh, innovation ever in this industry because we did not put thinking into the business model or the go-to-market capability. It's the best kept secret in the world. And that is why innovation without go-to-market capability and business model innovation does not get the benefits. Nor does it get the benefits if a brilliant sales guy tried to sell old technology because that will only be temporary. You need both. You need people who can come up with absolutely phenomenal groundbreaking technologies that can make a difference in the world. And then you need smart people who can translate it into how do I make aware of it and how do I create maximum value to the customers and to society. If you only have one of the sites, you will limp through a 100 meter race. Now, that was technology. That's all I have to say about it, uh, because that's pretty much as much as I know. Challenges ahead. <coughs> um, this is one of the best books I ever read. Uh, it's called Strategy and the Fat Smoker. Uh, and it's about most strategies are super obvious. And it's, uh, David Meister wrote the book, he said, most overweight smokers who go to the doctor and saying, I don't really feel well. They're not, what will, he, what will the doctor tell you? It's like buying in a consultant. They will tell you, yes, if you're, if you're not making a profit, you have to say cost. Woohoo! Surprise! And if you're a smoker and eat unhealthy and don't exercise, what will the doctor tell you? Stop smoking and exercise. What do you do? And that's why the strategy and the diagnosis is the simplest thing in the world, in, in most cases. The really difficult thing is to change your lifestyle and actually do it. And that's where we are right now. We're not just changing a few things here and there. Yes, we are, of course, saving costs. Yes, we are doing things. But the really difficult thing is to change your lifestyle. And that's what companies have to do, as uh, other uh, individuals have to. Some of the strategic challenges we have, uh, Lars, again, Lars Haven said, how will IT revolutionize uh, 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 diabetes? He said, I don't know. Same answer from me. How will digitalization revolutionize the pump business? business? I don't know. I can think of examples where instead of selling a pump, you sell how much water you move, but I don't know. And we have to find out. Same thing, <coughs> business models linked to digitalization. Who knows if the business models will change completely, so we are no longer selling components, maybe we're leasing, pay for performance or something completely different. It is not only about making a newer and better pump. And then always be paranoid about competition. Because what if we only had pumps and somebody who was really good at selling products and, uh, s and, and selling uh, go-to-market with products had invented the solution with a sensor system that can save water? That would have been a disaster for us. So, and in at the same time, if somebody can now make 95% of our performance at 50% of the price, honestly, you're not a stupid customer if you buy that. So always be paranoid, and we put in the Chinese flag simply because that is where the most likely unexpected competition is going to come from. Digitization and Chinese competitors are the two most biggest strategic threats we have, as is, of course, digitalization, a wonderful opportunity. And now, finishing off, we have taken the first steps for strange... Uh, uh, we, we, we are turned up first half results. We did almost double, but honestly, this is the easy bit. This is only must win battle one of, uh, of, of funding the journey. And we also have a much better full year result than last year. But that almost any idiot can do. Saving, uh, getting a better result for one year or two years, that is unpleasant, but it's not difficult. So the real test to what we are doing will come in three and five and ten years. So that's what we are up to. But the first results are, are there, and of course that is uh, gratifying. And then this is a slide I showed to, to, the, uh, to the teams, and this is the last one, that changing a business is not just changing a business. It is changing an entire culture. It is doing something radically different. And if you are an engineer who takes pride in doing relatively strange, sort of maybe a little bit marginal things in, a, in one of our product groups, and we tell them, no, we don't want to do that, we want you to do this. If you're the general manager of Brazil and all you care about is growth, and we tell you, we don't care about your growth, we want you to revitalize profitability. If you're a manufacturer and you're passionate about one thing and saying, no, we don't want to produce frequency con converters in Mexico and sell it back to Europe, we actually want you to do something different. That change will hit every single person in Grundfos. And change 
is wonderful as long as it hits others peop other people as long as it doesn't hit me. So the commitment has to come from saying, I'm on board and I'm co prepared to do what it takes for Grundfos. And therefore, we walk around, talk a lot about bacon, and that's not because I'm in the board of directors of Tulip Food Company. It's because that's a different kind of commitment than laying eggs and then moving on. So this is what I have to say. I hope it makes sense. Uh, Nils, now it's your turn to do some work. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mess. Uh, I think that when you when you left uh, Lego, I was afraid that you would l leave your enthusiasm in Billon and not bring it with you to uh, Brangbro. It sounds like you are still a very enthusiastic manager. Um, well, I guess my job today <coughs> will be very easy because you will do the questions and I will just read them loud and uh, please put forward questions and vote on them and I will uh, try to moderate uh, questions from us just if I can find out. Okay, let's take the first one, Mess. Um, if the pipeline systems in large cities are so inefficient, how can Grundfos convince key decision makers to change it and act on the threat of water scarcity? Scarcity. I, I have a hypothesis, um, but it's only a hypothesis because I actually only, even if it's embarrassing, it took me actually more than a year to understand just how brilliant this product is. But, but I think one thing is to tell about it, tell broad about it, what it actually can do, and to get into the right levels of the organizations. Because if you talk to an engineer who is asked to buy a more efficient pump, that engineer will buy a more efficient pump. But if you talk to somebody who has it on his plate to saying, you need to substantially lower the water leakage, then we'll have a different, uh, we will have a totally different uh, opportunity to talk to him. <laughs> but I think from our end, rather than just, just doing marketing, I think the most important thing we can do is to rethink the business model. I would actually think that instead of saying, we will sell you a demand-driven distribution sensor system, I would actually think that the smartest thing we can do is to go to the mayor of London and say, we will install everything it's not going to cost you a penny, and all I want for it is half the savings you'll generate. That's a totally different logic. It won't cost them anything, and we will get a lot more than the million kroner it will take. So I think it takes substantial business model innovation for us to address this and get the attention. And that demands a completely new culture in your company. And capabilities, because we don't have anybody who is experienced in developing new business models. You talked about... Um, Focusing on your core business, focusing on customer, agility, cash flow, it all sounds very logical. Yes. And you also talked it difficult to execute. Strategy in the fat smoker. Yeah. Um, but still, uh, is this a, the, the concept that any company can do? I, I think it's a concept that any company in our situation can do. I, I think we are probably, if you look at what is the urgency that we have, because some companies would probably be in a situation where they would not have the luxury to spend two years doing what we're doing now. Some companies would have their feet so much to the fire of making a transformation into a new business that they simply would have to do that in parallel. And I think we need to take the time, not a long time, not many years, but we need to take the time to have the fundamental improvement of our cash flow, our cost base and our margins before we start to do, do all other kinds of things. Is this only possible because you are in a company which is family owned and because of that the, the, the owner is patient? No, no, no. I, I think what we are doing now, any company would, would ask uh, a new CEO to do. I think what, where it will be a huge benefit from our ownership structure is what we're gonna do next. Because we will have to invest in our service capability, in capabilities around solution sales, we will continue to have a very high level of investment in R&D, and many more short-sighted uh, investors would say, we want you to continue to, 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 to improve your, your cash flows. We actually have a set target of saying, as long as we can get to around 10% return on sales, that's fine, then management is no longer rewarded to go beyond that. But we come from a, a level which is lower than half the industry average. So we need to get to a competitive level, but we are not rewarded to take it beyond there. And that's a huge privilege to have an owner who says that. I'm sure many would ask a question, how could this situation, it, also, it, it is almost a crisis, how could this situation in Grundfos, how could it occur? Because I think of the enthusiasm 
around the company and its purpose. So saying, we are here for something different than profits. And if you look around it, I mean, as opposed to Lego, who had its first uh, loss in 1998, Gornfoss has never had a loss, loss, loss making year, not in 70 years. So I think the culture of saying, we are in a financial crisis, I just think it is almost like s saying that, that the Pope has just said us, as, uh, has just uh, been swearing. It, it's, simply not, it's simply not something that belongs to the culture. And therefore, even saying crisis is something which is very difficult. Saying things are not good at Grundfos, that's like mixing oil and water. They don't, ag they don't accept. It's, it's, it's very difficult, but I think actually <laughs> it's, it, it is something that we've done a, a decent job actually creating because instead of saying our cash flow has now gone from this to this, saying we've lost two po percentage points every year, if we continue that in two years, we're going to be loss making. I get it. You're sure? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Okay. A completely different question. What is your best advice to the students present today that want to excel their careers? I think it is, I mean, I have a very basic philosophy. Uh, I, I actually have two. One is, and that's my, I'm grateful for my parents about that. They told me saying that what you should try your very best to do is to strive for making a positive difference in other people's lives. And everybody can do that. Whether you're an operator, at a stamping machine or whether you're a CEO, you can do that. And if you have that attitude, if you'd go, if you burn the midnight oil to arrange a symposium for the benefit of other people, you got it. Do stuff like that. And, and, and having a genuine intent to make a positive li a difference in other people's life, if you do that, you don't need to make a career plan. If you do that and work hard, you will make a difference in the world. And the other thing is, I mean, I, I had a, it was actually one of my old student friends, he said, he said that either people are hungry or they're not hungry. And you are, I guess, hungry. I, will, I, I, am, I actually think I'm going to die hungry. But I think if people saying, I, I mean, other people said either you're, you're living or you're on your way to live or you're on your way to die. And I think, I think people who are hungry to make a difference and don't just say, how fast can I get my BMW 5 Series? They will be the ones who make a difference, whether you're a student or you are a professional. A little similar question. <coughs> I got this question beforehand. What is best, good grades or extracurricular activities? <laughs> that is when you don't. That's when you have the terror of the awe, uh, because I think if you have crap grades uh, but have a lot of extracurricular activities, uh, th that's a challenge because there will be people who don't want to employ you. You can probably start, you'll probably be better at starting your own successful business. And I know many successful business people, their only, their only and main skill is risk willingness. And if you have risk willingness and you're prepared to work hard, then you can typically start your own <coughs> business. But if you want to go into a company like Novo Nordisk or McKinsey or Grundfos or Danfoss, coming with crap grades will not get you very far. What kind of student were you yourself in this regard? I was an average student who drank slightly more than average. <laughs> okay, that's a very good advice. Yeah. Um, how do you utilize what you learned at Lego in Grundfos? Hmm. It, it, it is, I have a very few very tangible things that I learned. And I mean, the, the fact that a strategy has to be sufficiently simple that we have to be very clear on what are the ultimately most important KPIs that we measure on. I took that very directly from Lego. But I think the most important things I take with Lego is not strategy or process, it's, it's who I am. Because working a place in 23 years for what something I had passion for shapes who I am. Uh, and therefore, the, the genuine intent of making a difference both in my colleagues' lives but also to, sh to ensure that what we do actually makes a real difference in the world. And say that with what I hope is a great authenticity is probably the most valuable thing I have from Lego. Do I miss Lego? No, not in a week of Sundays. I, uh, I, I will always have bricks in my veins because t sp being there 20 th 23 years and my wife still works for Lego. So, so I still hear about it, of course. But, but I, I, I love Lego and I always will. But I have to say I have not for a single moment regretted I left Lego. Um, Robert Ukla believes that leadership eats technology. What are your thoughts on this statement? I, I, I don't think they are contradictions because leadership in a company like ours without technology, I would actually rather say that technology leadership is what, what matters. But where I do agree that, I mean, there's a different version of this which says culture eats strategy. And that I think is very true. 
So unless, unless you are determined to make, to make courageous leadership steps that do not let the technology lead the company, but that take leadership and leverage technology through leadership, I think he's absolutely right. So I think the example I tried to give with making a 5 million Danish kroner investment, alpha reader rather than a 200 million new generation, that is, I believe, where leadership takes over from technology, but it's still enabled by technology because without the alpha reader, we just had a new rim, a red, a red plastic uh, lid on it, and probably not many people would have bought it. But I guess one of your biggest challenges will be to take your technology people, your engineers, <coughs> and make them think in a commercial mindset on the customer. You also said it, but how do we do it? I think the, in the interesting thing is we, we the, the three cultural elements we truly want to change is much is become more customer centric, more collaboration and taking accountability, meaning if you see a problem, you own it. That's what we're trying to target it to change. But the interesting thing is many people said customer centricity, that's impossible. We're 19,000 people. We can't all visit the customer. No. But if what you talk about is so don't develop a new product unless you deeply understand and ideally predict what does the customer actually need. And that is something the engineers actually like. They like to hear about and to understand customers' problem. And the interesting thing is, Paul Dewey Jensen, the old, he, was act he spent more time with customers than he did with his engineers because he was passionate about understanding the application in which the product was used. So this is something that is actually deeply ingrained in the culture. We just forgot it. Is this really the biggest challenge for you right now? The culture? Yeah. Well, it's an enabler to solve the biggest challenges, because I could spin a different twist on it. I could say that strategically, strategically, digitalization is the biggest challenge. Uh, but I could also say that without addressing and substantially reinventing a culture where these three things are pushed to the forefront, we will not succeed with our strategy. And then it's no longer my challenge, then it's a new CEO's challenge. Okay, okay. In the future, do you see water scarcity wasn't due to overpopulation or improved due to Gunfros and competitors' product penetration in emerging markets? See, water scarcity worsened. I think, I think there's no doubt that overpopulation will, will affect the size of the challenge, and urbanization will as well. Because more people moving into sort of geographically more dispersed or m more, more concentrated areas will mean that water supply is even more important. And the interesting thing is there won't be more water but the problem is that the world's most effective water cleaning plant, which is going through dirt down to the groundwater, takes too long. So I think there's, there's no way around us, both industry, but including policymakers who have to price water differently in order to use it more wisely. There's no doubt that we have to step up together to clean water faster and to have less waste and to also transport water effectively. Otherwise, the urbanization and the overpopulation is going to be a, a, a disaster. A big, huge disaster. Lars Rebjørn from Novo Nordisk has said uh, recently that he is simply lucky, and he means by that that there's getting more di diabetes in the world, and since he sells insulin, he's just lucky. It sounds that uh, you are maybe are also lucky. There will be a need for water, and Grundfos deliver the pumps. <laughs> the, the, the good thing is that the, tr the need to transport water and to clean water will not go away. It will only be bigger. But the, the, the challenging thing is that there's a huge conservatism in how this happens. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm not super concerned about whether there's going to be a demand for the type of products we make. Laos has the privilege of a 20% growing market every year. We have two. That makes it a little bit more of a fight for market share than, than he's used to. But I think the biggest problem is that unless both decision makers, policy makers and industry change our views and how we do things, then we simply won't move fast enough. And that, will be, that is why I think technology is, again, technology is not alone. If we, ma many technologies, not only from us, but from many other people exist, but if we don't change the conservatism in the market, then it simply won't move fast enough. Simon Giles said that the future firstly needs people that understand humans and communities, then, engineering, then engineers can build solutions. How does this relate to Grundfos? But I think it relates very, 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 very directly. I mean, unless we basically understand the needs of, of humans, which is actually not that difficult, because understanding the basic needs in a civilized society, the, water, the role that water plays and the role that heating and cooling plays is quite simple to understand. 
And we actually do have solutions to that. So we need to, un we need to understand what are the needs, but inclu including what are the different needs in the different parts of the world. Because in some parts of the world, just moving water from A to B is a huge privilege. In other parts, it's, it's whether the, the wa hot water in the shower comes in three or five seconds. So we are different stages, of course. But to build solutions is, is as I was talking about, is a fundamentally different thing. Not only to the capabilities of an organization, but also to simply understand the money-making logic of a company. A question here. Where will Grundfos be 50 years from now? I, I could add, 15 years from now, do you think we still will be making pumps? Yes. I think we'll still be making pumps, but I'm not sure we'll be selling pumps. I could imagine that we would be, we would, we would look at we are in the business of water. I actually think to some extent we still are. And like, like I used to say, w Lego is in the business of play, we just happen to comp compete in the toy market. I actually think in many ways, Grundfos is in the business of water, we just happen to compete in the pump market. I still think there would be new pumps because bits and bytes and computers won't move water. You still need impellers and shafts to do that. So I'm sure we'll be making pumps, but I think we'll make be making a lot of intelligence and systems and solutions and business models around it. But your core business is pump? Yes. Not handling water? Okay. Um, what is Grundfos strategy for expanding businesses business into Africa? We, we, we are actually quite present in Africa. It's not a huge business, but we have sales companies in different parts of both Middle East and Africa. And, and we actually have a product which I'm almost proud to say is loss making, because sometimes that feels like, like it's a good thing. I actually think there's a huge misunderstanding that, that to do good you have to lose money. But in this case we actually lose money. It's something we call lifelink, where it's the biggest problem uh, of Africa is the same as in many other developing parts of the world, that there is no, there's not a well-functioning water supply system. So they need this decentral supply of water. And we actually have a solar system, solar run system, where there's both a pump, a decentral water cleaning station, and then most importantly, there's actually what we call a dispenser where you can actually tap and prepay Everybody have mobile phones that actually prepay water and then with a system where you can actually tap water. And we are right now we are selling a hundred systems to the city of Nairobi in Kenya in order to get this decentral water supply out. So we, so that is and that's made specifically for Africa and But and I guess you are you are in Africa in order to make money. Of course we are. And you will? We will. How will you do that? We'll, we will in, we will take the necessary time to convince that we can create value. And then we, again, we'll have to think about should we install a new business model? Because for many local communities, spending 30,000 euro on a system that I'm talking about is an infinite amount of money. But if we said instead we will charge in a totally different way, then I'm convinced we can make money in Africa. So you, ha you have to invent a completely new business model I in, I'm in that market? I, I assume, but I could also imagine that with scalability, of these models, because it's uh, interestingly, these de decentral systems, if you replace something else in the municipal water systems with these, it's not more expensive, but of course that's going to be a long-term process. But we are not, we, there's no place in the world where we will have a, a strategy that it's okay to lose money in the longer term. But Africa is not a place where we make money today, but we will. Another question. Uh, how do I manage work-life balance? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually do. Uh, I, I actually do. I. Uh, it, but it, exactly like last last said an hour ago, it, you, it, it does not come for free. And, I, and, and it is, you have to burn the midnight oil. And you, as a CEO, you, never, you, you, ne you are never totally off. So even if I'm on a vacation or if I'm running in the morning or whatever I do to avoid diabetes, then, uh, <laughs> th then, then I, I have work with me. But, uh, so, but I, what I do is I have, I have hobbies. I'm an, I listen to loud rock music in the car. I'm a huge ACDC fan. Um, and, and if I, I mean, tonight I'm going to see the new James Bond movie, and there, I, that's, that's how I do that, and then uh, I, unless it's Monday mornings, or if I'm traveling, I always prioritize to have breakfast with my family, because that is, that gives me energy, and, and that then makes them not forget their father. But in practice, <coughs> you always work. Yes. Yeah. And if I text an email, SMS to you tonight, during the James Bond, are your telephone switched off? No, but it is on the silent, so I will answer you immediately after. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, how would you rate the importance of intellectual property rights? Do you see it as a tool to secure your competitive advantage? 
Yes, but less and less so. Uh, I, I think that I think that the the general trend is that you can protect intellectual property rights less and less. And it, it somebody will be smart enough to get so close that they may get just around the patent, but they'll be close enough to reap the benefits. And in a strange way, I actually think that intellectual property rights can also make companies lazy. Because if I have legal protection, I don't need to innovate. So I, 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 if you say I ultimately don't, I, if I ult in some strange way did not have any protection, it would be hugely unfair to those who spend money on, on innovation, but damn, would it speed up innovation. Because it's a, it's a wonderful way to say it's not the lawyers who protect us, it's our speed and competitiveness and market understanding. So if you remove intellectual property rights, yeah. you, you don't take away the motivation for innovation? I don't think you do. Uh, maybe in the pharma industry, mm. where you have such long life cycles. But I think it, on the, I actually think, in a strange way on the country, I think it would be unfair, because I would be pissed off if a Chinese competitor could copy our technology one to one, but I think it would end up making us faster. And the paradox is, if the Chinese would have the latest technology faster, it would do good for the world as well. But in China, are they not doing that already today, copying? Yes, they are, but, they, but there are some dimensions of the technology which they stay away from. Like they, they are not, they Either are not cannot or, 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 or do not. But they get extremely close, including copying the name. Including copying conference? Yes. They simply make your own brand? S some of them do. Okay. But they are not the most dangerous ones. La nor are the Lego copies who call it Lego are the most dangerous ones for them. Okay, we are running out of time. Um, would you be willing to risk negative cash flows on behalf of a major reduction in the water scarcity problem? Short term, yes. Long term, no. How do Grundfos make sure that the water makes its way not only to first world countries, but some of it is also safe for helping countries in need? I actually, but I actually think the interesting thing is I'm joining I was at a meeting with, uh, with the chairman of Nestlé the other day, and we, with Grundfos is joining something that's called the Water Resource Group thir uh, 2030. And the interesting thing is that that organization finds huge interest from India, Mexico, Vietnam, South Africa. But where they cannot get any attention is countries like China, US, and Germany. So I actually think is we're sitting on a time bomb in many countries where the bomb is actually already diffusing now, where because we are industrialized nations, we don't realize that we also have a water challenge. And I think if we continue in societies that could easily spend the money on pricing water differently, saving water in municipal s systems, or making legislation, small, just 10 seconds on an anecdote, if you actually have a, hot, a, a water circulator pump, it's only twice the size of my fist and a circulation system, just the water that you would not lose by turning up the shower and wait for hot water to come. If all American households had that, water corresponding to New York City's water consumption every year could be saved. Just from not cold water where you're waiting for the hot water. That could be solved like that with legislation. Okay, we are running out of time and I'm, I have to end at exactly three o'clock. Uh, Mass, anything to add for yourself? No, not, uh, nothing except that I actually envy you, uh, all of you students, because I have to say I haven't been here for, for, for a few decades. I even took a wrong turn, so I, I almost, I thought I could go through the parking lot. Somebody, somebody put up a building where I used to be able to drive through. <laughs> but but I, I have to say that the, that the, 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 the it sound, I so sound very old now, but the generation and what, what you know and what you intuitively understand which people like Nils and I have to learn by hard-earned experience and try to understand in terms of digitalization, in terms of business models, in terms of new ways of understanding society, and getting out and be change makers in companies that need that change desperately. I think you have an absolutely unique opportunity that we might not have had in, uh, in, in my old fart generation. So uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you, Mas. So thank you very much, Ms. Nibber, for a very inspiring talk. Please thank accept you. this gift. Thank you very much. As wow. a small token of our gratitude. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. You're welcome.
And of course, thanks to you, Ms. Lone, Thank you for, for moderating this session. We look forward to welcoming you back later today. Sure. Yeah. We, we can share, Nils. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs>